go on to John chapter 15. Coming to an end of this chapter, the Upper Room Discourse. We'll read the whole, the entire chapter. John chapter 15, and reading from verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it, before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you, for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Thus far we read in God's holy and infallible word. Our text this morning, verses 22 through 25. The inexcusable hatred. Jesus here, of course, uh, is seeking to, to comfort uh, his disciples. Uh, of course, has pointed to them uh, that which, of course, they, they will endure the hatred of the world, and, and it points to them uh, something of the, the cost of uh, what it will be to, to follow him. 
Um, and of course, he, he expounds this uh, a bit more clearly in, in Luke chapter 14, where there he speaks expressly of the cost of discipleship. And he tells them why it is that they will be hated. They will be hated by the world uh, because, um, well, because it hated him before them. They will endure that which he endures. And that, of course, which is yet to be seen by them. They haven't seen the half of it yet. But, of course, um, it reminds us, does it not, that we are all of us born into this world. The reason why Jesus tells us that we must be born again, we are all of us natural-born God-haters. And even we, even the children of God, even with grace uh, in us, uh, that still... That propensity still remains with us. Heidelberg Catechism uh, in Lord's Day 2 poses a question concerning God's law. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? Answer, in no wise, for I am prone by nature to hate God and hate my neighbor. That old nature is still in us right to the end. And so it points to the reality of the words of Jesus that to be born again, those, those uh, natures, they have to be changed, they have to be transformed. We must be born again, awakened to the irrationality of our sin and hating God, the insanity of our sin. The insanity of this, this, this inexcusable hatred of these people, uh, of these Jews, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Think on it, the only, the only good man, because, well, there's none good and there's none that doeth good, says God. Uh, the only good man that ever walked uh, the face of this planet, and, and what did we do to him? And you say, we? Well, that was 2,000 years ago. I wasn't there. That old spiritual song, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, we were all there. This inexcusable hatred of the Son of God. This man who calls sinners, who calls only goes about ever doing good. He calls sinners who, who are burdened, who are, who are laden with their sins, who, who are broken, some in body, some in mind, some, some in, in their souls. And, and he comes to them and he ministers to them and, and he lifts them out of the, the dregs of sin. He demonstrates his, his power to heal. Their religion comes to kill and destroy, but he comes to heal and to save. He comes to men, broken men and women, and yet, and yet he's hated and, he, and he's detested for it. And of course Jesus, he tells him, well, he tells his men, well, you're going to face exactly the same thing. And, and, and don't we see it? You know, you, 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 you know, you have somebody who's been delivered, even today, you know, delivered from a dissolute life, you know, drug abuse maybe, some kind of immorality, you know, and, and the Lord has, has, by His grace, you know, has, has lifted them out of the pit, you know, and, 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 and they're full of the joy of the Lord, their lives are back on track. And, and they're telling people, you know, you, you would expect people to be delighted for them, wouldn't you? Until, of course, you, they tell them who it was that did this for them. It was Jesus. And the teeth begin to gnash. And the hatred, the hatred comes out. This is the man who healed this is a man who saved. This is a man who only ever did good amongst them. And yet they, inexcusably, they hated him. This is a man who, in a heartbeat, could have destroyed every one of them, washed, washed them from the face of the planet. 
none suffered, none ever suffered like he. Hebrews 12 verse 3, For consider him, Jesus, this Jesus, that endured such contradiction. And wasn't it a contradiction of sinners against himself? Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You will experience the same contradiction of sinners as he did. Suffered as no man ever did suffer, ever will suffer. Why? Suffered and bled and died to take away our sin, our guilt, our shame, our blame. To freely justify us. He came to bring the free grace of God to us. The free love and the free justification of God to us. And he suffered in order to bring this to us. But of course in their hatred of him and their hatred of us, this hatred, there's, there's a divine purpose in it. There's a divine purpose of course in everything that God does. But even in this, in their inexcusable hatred of Jesus without cause and their hatred of us too. The purpose of God is in this. So the sin, the indefensible, and then thirdly, the purpose, the sin. Verse 22, Jesus, he says, um, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. If he had not come, well, 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 what, what does he mean? Surely... Surely they were sinners before this, before he came. Well, uh, but not this one. Yeah? Oh, they were sinful, they, they were guilty uh, prior to this, all the way back to Adam. By natural generation. Every single one of us conceived in sin, born in sin. Live and die in sin, but for the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So they were, they were sinners before, even before he came. The people themselves, uh, the, the nation of Israel. Think of the, the judgments uh, visited by, by God in, in previous day, in Noah's day. That violent generation flooded all except for eight souls. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Babylonian Empire, the judgments of God because of men's sins. So there were sinners before he came. But by Adam's singular primary act of rebellion from that seed, that deadly seed sown into man's nature, sin develops. It grows, it's not static, it grows and grows. The cup is ever and always filling up until it's full and then the judgment comes. The world that refuses to fear and to glorify God, that's what sin is. Not fearing, not glorifying God, that's the very purpose for which man was made. And these were guilty of that even before Jesus came. They were guilty of murder before Jesus came. They were guilty of lying. They were guilty of coveting. Every one of God's commandments. Idolatry. Wasn't that Israel's primary sin prior to the exile? Gross idolatry for which they were judged even then. So they were sinners long, long before he came. Guilt lay upon each and every person. They as a society... Their age, their generation, and previous ones. It's that swamp, it's that evil age that Paul speaks of in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. Present evil age, right from the beginning, like a mighty river all the way through the generations. Man's sin, the sin of humanity feeding into it. Like a mighty, filthy swamp of human sin. So they were guilty of sin before, before he came. All of them. All kinds of sins. 
But not this one. Not this one. Not their inexcusable hatred of the Son of God. All sin is evil, of course. Some sins are worse than others. The first table of the law, for instance. Some would perhaps say that the slaughter of infant children in Israel uh, two weeks ago. That's, that would be the greatest sin. Maybe perhaps abortion, you would say, is the worst sin. The worst sins are the, against the first table of the law. Against God. Idolatry, blasphemy. But this one, rejection of the Son of God, the one who came to bring the grace and love of God to humankind, rejection of Christ, brings condemnation to the uttermost upon, upon men. These who inexcusably hated the Son of God and, and, and crucified Him, Bet, better they had better they had lived and ne never heard him never seen him as the good bishop J.C. Ryle says if men are not born again better they had never been born at all but God Acts chapter 17 verse 13 God has given notice to the world that he intends to judge the world the entirety that is of civilization, every man, woman, and child born into this world, to judge them by this man, the one whom he has raised from the dead, even Jesus. So their sins are, sins are not ignored. There is a, a, a time of accountability, of judgment. But if Christ had not come, they wouldn't have been guilty of this sin. They wouldn't have been guilty of the sin of hating Christ and of rejecting Christ. Or they ever hated God, but the coming of Christ exposes it, makes it obvious. He comes. He comes with the grace of God, the free grace of God, the free love of God, the free justification of God. And, and they gnash their teeth at it. They, they hate it. You see it in the parable of the prodigal son. It's not about the prodigal son. The punchline's the elder brother. What's, what's the response of the elder brother to the free grace of God? The free justification of God? This man receives sinners. He's angry. He's gnashing his teeth at the grace of God. This is Israel's religion. It's... it's, it's um, it's legalism on steroids. And Jesus, with all these parables, you know, they, 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 they gnash their teeth, they, they rage against them because he's exposing what's in their hearts. He's showing them they're just like that elder brother. Oh, religious to their back teeth. But nothing of the grace of God. Religious in appearance. All outward show. Oh, they, they were waiting for Messiah to... Oh, when Messiah comes, all will be different then. There'll be no Roman soldiers and Israel will be free. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for Messiah to come. But when Messiah comes... When Messiah comes, they hate him. They inexcusably hate him. You know, when we talk about the coming of the Lord again, we talk about Jesus coming again, we think, you know, we say, well, we say that that will be the answer to all the problems. But let, you know, Jesus come again. But the Jesus is coming again. Have we got the reality of that? Is that really what we want? Because he is going to sort a lot of things and a lot of people out. The Jews wanted Messiah to come, but they didn't want this one. Yeah. They didn't want this one. And of course, um, well, it's just the same today. You know, nice, kind people 
uh, today, you know, that um, until you speak about Jesus, until you, even religious people, until you speak about the, the real Jesus, you know, and, and what it was that he came for, and what it was that he did and seeks to accomplish, you preach the gospel to them, and, and, and their hearts are exposed. I was, uh, I was, one occasion, um, just over a year ago, I, I, I was preaching in Stafford in the market, the marketplace there in Stafford, and um, uh, an old lady came up to me, and you would have thought that butter would have melted in her mouth. You, that you, you think somebody's sweet old granny, you know? She, 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 she was a picture, you know. Until, of course, I, I start talking to her about Jesus and the rage and the anger. And there's a bunch of kids over to my left and they're all shouting, oh, look at him, he's upsetting the old lady. And there's another Christian woman behind them. She shouts out, no, no, he's being kind to her. He's telling her the truth. But she was all sweetness until Jesus was mentioned, until sin was mentioned, and the rage in her heart, her inexcusable hatred of Jesus is exposed. That's how it was with Jesus. That's how it will be how it was for his disciples. And that's how it will be for us too in this world. So secondly, the, the indefensible. Verse 25, he says, This comes to, come to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Hatred of God incarnate. Hatred of a, a sinless man. Hated. They want it. They want, they want a God, yes. And they want a Messiah, but they want one in their own, of their own imagination. Yeah. They waited for Messiah to come, that was their hope, but not this one. Matthew 21. But last of all he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. They've got a history of bloodshed behind them, killing the prophets, stoning them. Now the son comes, and what did they do to him? Let's kill him. Oh yeah, they want a Messiah, they want a Savior, and they want one today as well. Somebody come on, sort out all the world's problems, all the nation's problems. Somebody to, to bring an end to all the poverty. To do what the United Nations promised they would do but never have done. Bring an end to all the wars, you know. Bring an end to the homelessness, the disease. Take away the cancer, save the planet, stop the oil even. That kind of Savior. Fine, loved, but not a saviour from sin. Not a saviour who exposes men's hearts, the hatred, the greed, the avarice, the, the wickedness, the evil in their hearts. Not a saviour from sin. But it's not just that he's come, that he's come, that, that's part of the problem. But there's something else that he does that they don't like, that causes them to hate. He speaks as well. He's a speaking saviour. Verse 22, if I hadn't spoken, he said. They'd have been quite happy with him if he had been dumb, if he hadn't spoken. And if he hadn't spoken the truth. But he wasn't silent, he, was, he, he, he spoke and he was outspoken. And what he spoke was offensive to their ears, to their very hearts. It caused them to rage. They had murdered, they had murdered their own scriptures, their own Jewish scriptures with their tradition. They had buried the gospel of God's free grace, free love, and free justification. They had buried it under an avalanche of their tradition, their religious traditions. In, in uh, Luke, 
11.52, he says, he says, And woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. They didn't want the gospel. They wouldn't enter into God's kingdom. But not only that, they were guilty of keeping others from entering in. They established their own religious authority. They established their own moral authority. We, not God's word, we'll say what's right in terms of the worship of God. We will say what's right in terms of morality. They, t they used their religion to lord it over the people. But he, Jesus, he comes with authority. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, he says, and doeth them shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Verse 28, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Divine authority. He speaks the word of God. If he had not spoken, they rejected his words. Verse twenty: uh, uh, If they keep my say, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But they did not keep his words. They didn't like his words because his words exposed their sins, exposed their hearts. So, you know, when you tell people that the Bible, that God is about more than love, that he's holy, he's the thrice holy God, and requires of us that we be holy. When we, when we speak the words of Jesus, when we speak the words of the gospel, the, the free grace of God, the free love of God, the free justification of God. When we preach these things, preach the gospel, Christ to sinners, just the same, it convicts them of their sin. Because it demands of them change. It demands of them a change that they cannot perform of themselves. It demands a repentance that they cannot achieve. Only by, the, only by the free grace of God. It's an unconditional gospel. We don't, demand, we don't demand that men repent before coming to Jesus. They come to Jesus and then they're able to repent. It convicts them of their sin and of their, their hatred of God and of His Son, of, of, of Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he, he, he speaks of his works, works that, that, that no man ever did. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, none other man could do, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my father, because the works he did were his father's works. And the works, the works that he did were, were works that, that, that no, no other man could do. They were a demonstration of who he was in reality. Extraordinary works, inexplicable works. Giving sight to the blind, raising the dead to life. Things that only God himself could do. Evidence, authentication of who he was and is. Confirmation, authentication of his teaching of the doctrine of the gospel. which of course already had been authenticated. He says in John 10, verse 30, 37, if, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him, that we are one and the same. 
by works. But if he had not come and done these works, if he had not spoken, if he had not come, they would not have had this sin. But because he has come, because he has spoken, and because he has done the works, they hate him inexcusably. They hate him without a cause. Who but God can heal the blind? Who but God can raise the dead? No excuse, no excuse, none whatsoever. Now, verse 22, for their sin. No cloak, no hiding place, no refuge. Their hearts and their hatred for God and for His Son has been exposed by the coming of the Son of God. Men say, they protest, they say, oh no, we love Jesus, we don't hate Him. An imaginary Jesus. Not the Jesus of the Bible. Not this one. When they encounter the real Jesus and what it is that he demands of us. When he opens our hearts and reveals the real heart condition of men and women. They begin to resent him and hate him indefensibly without excuse. Inexcusable hatred. That's what his men will face as they they take the baton and run with the gospel after his death and resurrection. This is what they're going to be faced with. And this is what we will be faced with, beloved in Christ, to the end of the age. Think it not a strange thing when these things come upon you. But the purpose, verse 25, but this comes to pass, that the word might be be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. Fallen human nature, however religious, anti-God in spirit, that's, that's that's what we are by nature. Hating God and hating our neighbor, the very antithesis of the law. There are men who, no matter what we say or do, no matter what is, is shown to them, demonstrated before them, even, even miracles of grace will not have God. You need to get used to that. Some men that won't have God at any price. And because they hate Him, they will hate you also. This was prophesied, says Jesus, in Psalm 35. For without cause have they hated me, for their, their, uh, they, they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. And in Psalm 69, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. That's the majority of mankind he's saying Jesus of course knew only too well what he was faced with the hatred the rejection that he would encounter he is the man of sorrows rejected of men his prophets I predicted long long ago gratuitous unreasonable hatred of men Isaiah 53, despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Holy to the uttermost, perfectly righteous and good. Even the overflowing fountain of all good. And yet hated of men inexcusably. He preached the truth. The truth as it is in he himself. Jesus. The truth of the grace of God. The truth of the state of mankind. Of our hearts. Of our lives. Of our sins. Of our guilt. Of our eternal destinies. The truth. The truth. He warns men in love. He heals the sick. And yet he is hated undeservedly. Hated. And you will be too. 
for doing exactly the same thing in love. But they hated him. They hated him without a cause because, well, because it was predicted, but because it was determined, it was decreed of God that he should be hated inexcusably. But because a thing is decreed of God, does not reduce man's responsibility. That doesn't take away their guilt. So why was it decreed of God? Because God needed him on the cross. That's why. And this is the means of getting him there. Yeah? There has to be a cross. God decreed that right from the very beginning. When he said, let there be a light, he also said, let there be a cross. He said, let there be a tree, and let it grow, let it flourish, and let it be hacked down, and let it be replanted on a hill called Calvary, and let my son there in the hatred of men, let him be crucified and dead and buried, so that my people can be saved, redeemed by his blood. For our salvation. That's the purpose. Their inexcusable hatred is inexcusable, but it's necessary. Because their hatred drove him to the cross to suffer and bleed and die, to take away your sin, your guilt, your shame, your blame, to lift the curse of God from off of you, that's due to you, the wrath of God from off of you, to liberate you, to set you free, to make you a child of God by the free grace of God, the free love of God, and the free, absolutely free, unconditional, justification of God through faith in his blood shed on that cross and yet these men hate hate the very one the very one who came to bring this grace bring this grace to them that they could be unconditionally that they didn't have to be religious yeah they didn't have to be anything they didn't have to do anything they didn't have to pay anything without money without price no conditions none none whatsoever somebody here this morning says but 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 well i haven't done this i haven't done that unconditionally what do you not understand about unconditionally you say i haven't repented unconditionally Without money, without price, without any conditions at all. You come to Jesus. Jesus is dead for you. And he's alive from the dead for you. To justify you. You come to him. You come to me, he says. And I give you life. You come to me and I save you. You just come. Let him who is a thirst come. Oh, but you say I'm not thirsty. In the very next verse he says, Whosoever will, let him come. Come, take me, and I'll save you. No conditions, not at all. The fullness of the freeness of the grace of God in Jesus Christ and the generosity of the love of God for a mankind of sinners, Jesus People, men ask the question, what is the gospel? One word, Christ. He is the gospel. A deed of gift of grant to mankind. This is John 3.16. To all mankind, a savior, a mediator. This one whom they inexcusably hated, God has made available to mankind, all sinners of mankind. Here's my deed of gift. Here's my son. 
Take the gift. Receive Him. And I love you everlastingly. Freely receive you. Freely offered to you. Freely set before you. And all you have to do is, is simply take. Is simply take. A child. Probably a child, an infant child I mean. Probably understand, get it better, you know, the, with adults, you know, as we grow, we grow in our cynicism, like, you know, and our unbelief. Except you become as little children. You know. Ask a child, ask a child like that, how, how do you receive a gift? The child will tell you. It's quite simple. And so is this. You just reach out the, the hand of faith. God says, I so love the world, this wicked, evil world that inexcusably hates my son. I so love this evil, wicked world. It's not the size of it, it's the evil, the badness of it. I so love this bad, bad world that I gave, gave, gifted my son. Take him. And whosoever takes him shall not perish, but have everlasting love, life, all the blessings of God, the grace, the love, the kindness, the forgiveness, the eternal life, the peace, the joy, all of it, all of it. All the blessings of all the blessings that God has for any human being in this world. You take Jesus and you get them all. But in inexcus inexcusable hatred for him, you reject him, you get nothing at all. You can't get the benefits without the benefactor. It's Jesus I'm preaching, not his benefits. You take him and you get it all. You get everything. You simply... Reach out the hand of faith and you receive him. You take me, says Jesus. Take me, take me, take me. Here I am for you. I'm dead for you and I'm alive from the dead for you. To freely justify you, freely love you, freely grace you. Just take me, take me, take me. Came to his own, his own people, the Jews. And they're still the same today in all their troubles back there. He came to his own people, but they didn't receive him. But to them who did, who believed on his name, he gave them the right, the authority, the power to become that which they were not. What were they? Inexcusable Christ God haters. He gave them the right, the authority to become instead children of God. That's how you get saved. You stop hating Jesus and you start loving him, receiving him, believing, trusting in him. Amen. Well, let's sing as we come to a close this morning. 719. 719. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We Go not forth alone against the foe. Strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender, we rest on thee, and in thy name we go. Number 790 will stand to sing. Rest on thee, our shield and our...